Smoking is an issue that most people have strong beliefs towards, either for or against. It may be logical to assume that most people who smoke must have a more positive attitude towards smoking. But if you think about it, it's more complex than that, isn't it? I mean, it's possible for someone to have a negative attitude towards smoking, but still be a smoker themselves. In this lesson, we're going to explore what attitudes are in psychology and why they sometimes totally don't match a person's behavior. First, some definitions. An attitude in psychology is a learned, stable, and lasting evaluation of a person, object, event, or idea that can affect someone's behavior. Of course, there are attitudes that we are aware of, which we call explicit attitudes, but also attitudes that we may not be aware of, called implicit attitudes. Either way, both have an effect on our behavior. Now, it's worth saying that attitudes aren't inherently bad. I mean, without them, it would take much more time and effort to make decisions, process information, or stand up for our values and beliefs. For example, the attitude that exercise is important is more likely to influence your behavior towards healthy living. But does an attitude always convert into a behavior? Well, if the facts and the situation align with your attitude, then yes, it'll be far more likely to be expressed in your behavior. But does an attitude always convert into a behavior? Well, if the facts and the situation align with your attitude, then yes, it'll be far more likely to be expressed in your behavior. We call this attitude specificity. For example, if you support a certain team and you're amongst friends who do as well, it's easy to express that attitude in your behavior. I mean, no one's going to make fun of you for that. On the flip side though, your attitude about exercise being good may be harder to express if you've tried healthy eating for three days and it didn't seem to pay off. <clears throat> Not speaking from experience at all, of course. But yeah, you know, all of a sudden those donuts are looking real good. And before you know it, they're in my belly. I mean, you know, the hypothetical person's belly. Psychologists are really interested in moments like these because acting in a way that contradicts your beliefs is something that's quite uniquely human to do. A robot would not be able to go against its programming unless, I guess, it was programmed to do so. But you get what I mean. We humans are complicated. This contradiction is known in psychology as cognitive dissonance, that discomfort felt when there's a discrepancy between a person's attitude and their behavior. It's that feeling when you're telling a lie and you know that you should be honest. The dissonance is uncomfortable and people go to considerable efforts to try and justify what they did. You might say that, well, you know, it's, it's better that you lied instead of hurting your friend. And so, you know, you're still being a good, honest person and not really going against your beliefs. In his 1964 book, When Prophecy Fails, Festinger, the guy who came up with the theory of cognitive dissonance, observed members of a cult who, amongst other things, believed that the world was soon going to be destroyed by a flood. Of course, the biblical account said that Noah's flood would never happen again, but that clearly wasn't relevant here. When the flood, well, didn't occur, the researchers observed how the members responded. They noticed that members who weren't as committed were more likely to recognize that they had been foolish and tricked by the cult. But some who had fully committed to it, like leaving their jobs and selling their houses, were far more likely to reinterpret the evidence and say that it was because of their faithfulness that the flood was prevented. In the first case, cognitive dissonance caused people to change their attitudes. In the second case, cognitive dissonance caused people to justify their behavior. Their attitude didn't change one bit. While there are criticisms of this study, including neglecting many other possible contributing factors, Festinger and the researchers concluded that the more invested someone is, the less likely cognitive dissonance will cause them to rethink their underlying attitude. They'll simply come up with ways to justify or perhaps change their behavior. This flowchart summarizes the process. If a person acts in a way that's consistent with their beliefs, there's no internal tension and therefore no discomfort. But if there's cognitive dissonance, a person might ease the tension by changing their attitude, changing their behavior, or finding a way to justify the contradiction between the attitude and behavior, especially if they're really invested in it. Cognitive dissonance happens to all of us because no one is totally consistent with their attitudes and behavior. The question is, when is it the time to hold to your beliefs and not be swayed by the results? And when is the time to realize that maybe it's your attitudes that were wrong in the first place and change them for the better? Doing so will require courage, but you're the only one who can do it. Hey guys, Practical Psychology here, and in this video we're going to be talking about 12 cognitive biases.
Most of these were researched by Ismanoff TV, who has some great animations on topics like these and other self-development topics, so check them out in the description or on the end screen. Now let's get into it. Number one is anchoring bias. We humans usually completely rely on the first information that we receive, no matter how reliable that piece of information is when we take decisions. The very first information has tremendous effect on our brain. For instance, I want to sell you a car, and you are interested to buy it. Let's say you ask me what the price is, and I tell you $30,000. Now, if you come back a week later and I say I'll sell it to you for $20,000, this seems like a new, very cheap price to you, right? Because your judgment is based on the initial information you got, which was $30,000. You feel like you're getting a great deal, but... Let's say the first time that you ask me and I say $10,000 and then you come back the next week and I tell you I'm going to sell it to you for $20,000. Now it doesn't look like a very good deal because of the anchoring bias. This is just a very generic use of the anchoring bias and I don't want a bunch of comments about why a $30,000 car should be sold for $10,000 but another example is trees. What if I asked you if the tallest tree in the world was higher or lower than 1,200 feet and if so, how tall? The same effect occurs if I ask you to guess out of thin air instead of giving you an anchor of 1,200 feet. The results are crazy. Number two, availability heuristic bias. People overestimate the importance of information that they have. Let me give you an example here. Some people think that terrorism is the biggest threat to the United States because that's what they see on TV. The news always talks about it. And because of that, it inflates the danger. But if you look at the real perspectives, televisions cause 55 times more deaths than terrorism. Yes, TVs literally fall on people and kill them 55 more times than terrorism. You are more likely to be killed by a cow than a terrorist, according to the Consumer Product Safety Commission. It's more likely to die from a coconut falling on your head and killing you than a terrorist attack. Thank you, Gary Vaynerchuk, for that one. Even the police that are hired to protect you from terrorists. It's estimated that you are 130 times more likely to be killed by the police than by a terrorist. That's because people do not make their decision based on facts and statistics, but usually they make it on news and stories and stuff they hear from other people. It's way scarier to die from a terrorist attack than a falling coconut. And because of this, usually the news won't cover it because there's not much money in it. Number three is the bandwagon effect. People do or believe in something not because they actually do believe it, but because that's what the rest of the world believes in. In other words, following the rest without thinking. If you've ever heard someone say, well, if your friends jump off a bridge, would you? Then that someone is accusing you of the bandwagon effect. It happens a lot with us. I mean, a lot of people vote for a certain candidate in the election because he's the most popular, or because they want to be part of the majority. It happens a lot in the stock market, too. If someone starts buying a stock because they think it's going to rise, then a lot of other people are going to start picking the stock as well. It can also happen during meetings. If everyone agrees on something, you are more likely to agree with them on that object. In management, the opposite of this is called groupthink, and it's something companies try very hard to deter. Because if 9 out of 10 people agree on something, but the last person doesn't and won't speak up, it could squelch a great idea. Number four is choice supportive bias. So people have the tendency to defend themselves because it was their choice. Just because I made the choice, it must be right. For example, let's say a person buys an Apple product. Let's say it's a MacBook instead of a Windows PC. Well, he's more likely to ignore the downsides or the faults of the Apple computer while pointing out the downsides of the PC. He is more likely to notice the advantages of the Apple computer and not the Windows computer. Why would someone point out that they made a bad decision? Well, let's say you have a dog. You think it's awesome because it's your dog, although it might poop on the floor every now and then. The same goes for political candidates. Not the pooping part, but they both may suck. But one of the lesser of two evils may be more right in your mind because you voted for them. Number five, confirmation bias. We tend to listen to information that confirms what we already know, or even interpret the information that we receive in a way that confirms the current information that we already have. Let's say that your friend believes that sweets are unhealthy. This is generally a pretty broad belief. He will only focus on the information that confirms what we already know. He is more likely to click on videos that confirm that belief, or read articles that support his argument. He doesn't go through and type, positive health effects of increasing blood glucose levels, or positive effects of eating a bowl of ice cream. No, he will instinctively go to Google and type in, how bad is sugar for you? The confirmation bias is a very dangerous in scientific situations and is actually one of the most widely committed cognitive biases. Number six, the ostrich bias. This is the decision, or rather subconscious decision, to ignore the negative information. It may also be an indication we only want to consider the positive aspects of something. This goes beyond not only looking for the positive information, but this is when there is negative information and we choose to ignore it as an outlier. Sometimes, even when we have a problem, we try to ignore it thinking it will go away. Let's say you have an assignment to do. It's not something that you really want to do, so you may just keep on procrastinating with it because your mind thinks that it will go away or is solved by ignoring it. 
Smokers usually, they know it's bad for their health, but a lot of them keep ignoring the negative implications of cigarettes, thinking it will not damage them or might stop them before anything serious will happen, because they consider themselves an outlier. To avoid finding out negative information, we just stop looking for it. Now, this could be a serious crime in many scientific research laboratories, and basically promotes ignorance. Number 7. Outcome Bias We tend to judge the efficacy of a decision based primarily on how things turn out. After a decision is made, we rarely examine the conditions that existed at the time of the decision, choosing instead to evaluate performance solely or mostly on whether the end result was positive or not. In other words, you decide whether an action is right or wrong based on the outcome. This goes a little bit into consequentialism, but it goes hand in hand with the hindsight bias. Let's say there's a manager who wants to take the decision. His team and the data are telling him to make one decision, but his gut is telling him to make another decision. Well, he goes ahead and makes the decision that his gut told him to do. And then in the end, it was the right decision. Does that mean it's actually better to trust your gut rather than listen to your team who is advising you based on facts and statistics? Well, that's what the outcome bias is. You take the decision and base the effectiveness of your decision on the outcome, even if it was luck. Now, this is bad logical thinking and will actually lead you to ruined thinking and bad outcomes in the long run. Number 8. Overconfidence Sometimes you get too confident and start taking decisions not based on facts, but based on your opinion or gut because you have been correct so many times in the past. For example, you are a stock trader and you pick 5 stocks, and in a couple years all of them turn out to be successful or profitable. It increases your confidence to a point to where you can start believing that whatever stock you pick will be successful. It's quite dangerous because you might stop looking at the facts and solely rely on your opinion. Check out the gambler's fallacy if you want more information on this. Just because you flipped a coin 5 times and it landed on heads doesn't mean that the next time there's more than a 50% chance of it landing on a head again. Ego is the Enemy is a great book about this bias, and I just made a book review on it. Number 9. Placebo Bias When you believe something will have a certain effect on you, then it will actually cause that effect. For instance, you are sick and the doctor gives you a certain medicine. Even if that medicine does not actually help you, even if it's just made of sugar, you believe that it will help you and it actually causes you to recover quicker. This might not sound very logical, but dozens of experiments have proven this. That's why if you realize positive people usually have positive life, and vice versa. The way you think is super important, and we've hit on this in previous videos. For the same reason, a lot of personal development books say that if you really believe something, you will eventually achieve it, or at least find a way to achieve it. Because a placebo effect will give you the motivation that you need. The mind truly is a powerful thing. And this actually isn't always bad thinking. In fact, you can use a placebo effect in our advantage if we use it wisely. There's actually a reverse of this, and it's called the nocebo, and this is when it is negative. Number 10. Survivorship Bias this bias is when you are judging something based on the surviving information. Let me give you an example here. There are a lot of articles titled like, 5 things millionaires do every morning. Does that mean doing those things every morning will make you a millionaire? No, there are tons of people who did them and didn't become a millionaire. But there are also tons of people who did them and did become a millionaire. So these articles are primarily based on the ones who survived and reject all other people who did the same thing but did not become millionaires. Another example is to say that buildings in an ancient city were built using extreme engineering because they lasted so long. This is a bad conclusion because you aren't considering what ratio of buildings were built to how many that lasted. You're only seeing the ones that lasted thousands of years of weathering when the other 90% have already washed away. It's hard to know what you don't know. Number 11. Selective Perception I like this one. Selective perception is a form of bias that causes people to perceive messages and actions according to their frame of reference. Using selective perception, people tend to overlook and forget that contradicts their beliefs or expectations. Let's say, for example, you're a smoker and you're a big fan of soccer. You are more likely to ignore all the negative advertisements about cigarettes because since you are already smoking, you have this perception that it's okay to smoke. But if there's an advertisement about soccer, you are more likely to notice it because you have a very positive perception about it. This is actually something really interesting and has to do with how you perceive the world due to your subconscious mind and what it filters out. The last one is called the blind spot bias. If I asked you how biased you are, you would probably say that you are less biased than the average person, and you are more likely to base your judgment on facts and statistics, and that's what's known as a blind spot bias, or the bias bias. You are biased because you think that you are less biased than everyone else. For example, I gifted something to my teacher, and the next week she gave me a good grade on a test. If you ask her whether she was biased when she gave me that grade, the answer will be that the gift never affected her decision when marking my paper. But if you ask her if other teachers are biased when students give them gifts, she will say yes, in most cases. And that's what the blind spot bias is. I really enjoyed creating this video, but most of the content was curated by my friend Izmanov. He's got a channel similar to mine, and I'd like you to check it out here or in the description. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and learned something. If you want more valuables like this, check out my channel and subscribe. Thanks for watching.